Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everyone. Today on the show, we have Kathleen O. Kathleen is a coach, writer, and safe drug use advocate and an educator specializing in psychedelic integration. Her primary focus has become understanding her responsibility in anti racist, capitalist, and colonial systems of oppression, especially in New Age spirituality, self help, and wellness coaching. She has been in and around areas of mental health work for 25 years, working in private practice since 2007. Her niche clients are online business owners, entrepreneurs, and medical and legal professionals. She has lost close friends and relationships with her community members to controversial conspiracy groups. You can find out more about her work at coachkathleeno.com or request an appointment with her by sending an email to info at lalitchcenter.org. Here is Kathleen now. It is so good to have Kathleen O with me today. This is a subject that I have been very focused on in my work, uh, dealing also with the fallout from it in my counseling work. I just put together a video that's available on my website uh, that I recorded a few weeks ago, and I've spoken about this at conferences, but I haven't yet had someone on the show talking about this issue. And I'm so happy that you are. I know I'm I'm being mysterious to the listeners, but please introduce yourself and then we will start talking. Go ahead. The big reveal, Rachel, is my name is Kathleen O and I am a coach. And so the reason that you're here to talk to us today is why? Well, there's a lot of really unfortunate things that are happening in the coaching industry. There's a lot of harm that's being done. There's a lot of conversations that aren't being had. And there's a lot of people that really don't know either that they're being harmed or what to look for when hiring a coach and how the entire industry needs to be questioned. People need to have this conversation and need to talk about what's happening because what is happening is not acceptable. So much of what I talk about with people um, has to do with safeguards or the lack thereof and oversight and the lack thereof in every area. It can be from uh, relationships where a person trying to control you and manipulate you will have you keep things secret so that there can't be oversight so they can kind of exist in the shadows and get away with things in the shadows to religious organizations, businesses. And then going for counseling. I have been, you know, a bit at odds with my board, uh, the Board of Behavioral Science, in that some of the courses that you take, the mandatory courses that you take for continuing education credit about ethics, law and ethics, some are clear about what's okay. And some is so murky. And I can see how people could take advantage of that and how people who want to take advantage of it could find their loopholes. Um, where things are kind of okay-ish, you know, but not reportable enough-ish. And it's in this area that it really makes me nervous. And so there are plenty of people who are fully licensed and who are, you know, psychiatrists to psychologists to therapists, social workers all across the board who should not be practicing, who are dangerous people. And I want to safeguard people about that. This isn't just about having a license or not. This is about how you use your profession, the the kind of the power that you're given and um, how you use it, how you abuse it. But then, yes, there is sort of this wild and woolly area called coaching. And there's some people who are really, really good and um, have great instincts about what's okay and have really good internalized 
locus of control and know ethically how to guide themselves and others just don't. And I want to say one other thing before I want you to talk about what your concerns are and also how to distinguish. So when people go out there, I think it's good to highlight how to distinguish healthy from unhealthy. But I remember someone saying to me, I wanted to go for counseling, but I decided to go for coaching. It was going to be more short-term and goal-oriented. And don't worry, I'm seeing someone who has a website and they're, they call themselves a professional coach. And I said, what is that? What is that? What is a professional coach? It's like, I wouldn't call myself a professional therapist. So I just didn't know what that meant. And she said, I mean, it must mean that they're licensed, that they're a professional coach. And I said, why don't you go on the website and look into it? And it turns out they're a coach for professionals. So they call themselves a professional coach. <laughs> so sometimes you have to look into the wording that's used. And even people who say they're counselors aren't necessarily licensed counselors. So tell us about what you've seen and what your concerns are. And then hopefully we'll get we'll have time to do this sort of distinguishing list of what's kosher from what's not. So go ahead. Yeah. So to be honest, I have been in those murky waters and have practiced uh, questionable practices and not always known better. And you're right, it's not a regulated industry and there are no guardrails. People really aren't able to even know what's acceptable and what's not. So in the process of becoming a coach, my early career was in social work. And then I, in the province that I live in, the work in the sort of the realm of therapy became regulated. So I could not be licensed with my qualifications. I had other um, certifications and work that now I understand is stuff I should have questioned more, but didn't in the realm of what was called energy psychology or subconscious programming through hypnosis or NLP or emotional freedom techniques. Those were modalities that I was practicing in my private practice. And so I became a coach because it was the easiest route to continue my practice. And in my defense, that involved a program that I had sought out through the University of Toronto. And I felt was a qualified program because at that point, I also realized that there wasn't a lot of science behind the work that I was doing. And there was science behind coaching protocols like solution-focused coaching. And then I went into positive psychology certification. So I was trying to put guardrails up for myself. I was trying to acknowledge, okay, where I was in the beginning and where I am now is different. And the people that had taught me how to do the work that I was doing, we never talked about safety. The biggest risk was that, you know, I remember quoting my teachers, which is the worst thing that could happen is nothing. And that's not true, especially in those experiences when you're, you're working with people's, you know, most intimate um, parts of themselves. And, you know, in coaching, it's not therapy, but you have to be prepared for what shows up. And it's not the worst thing that can happen is nothing. Because what happened in my own experience with a coach was that I was completely, I would say, disassembled by a coach that I trusted. I was a student and she was a teacher. She also had a PhD in neuroscience. She wasn't trained in, in the modality that she was doing. And so what I was noticing in my own work was that what I had been taught was not true. And the things that I was seeing in my clientele was helpful, but not great. And I also had been trained to kind of sell these promises. And you can't. That's not really helpful to be able to offer people those promises and that I am the only one that can help them deliver that. So, you know, it sets people up either to no longer believe in themselves or wholly believe in me as somebody who is going to get them to the other side of their experiences. And at the time, I had a reputation that 
was successful in those in that work, but I didn't understand that that was really disempowering for the client. I want to respond to something, well, a lot of the things that you said, and then I want to hear more about your experience. And first, I want to just say, I thank you for for being really open about what you feel that you completely innocently and inadvertently were involved in and involved in doing. There are so many people who come to me and will say, I got involved in a large group awareness training, and then I started being a trainer, or I, I learned in my particular psychoanalytic institute, training institute, how to talk to people and how to really push them. And the more response I got, the better. If they were really falling apart or writhing around or crying, then something was happening. And now in retrospect, I realize I may have been damaging them. I may have been pushing them too far, but I didn't know. This was my first introduction to how to do this. And I thought I was being helpful. And also, yeah, sometimes people will think that the more they get from somebody, the more they're helping them, but it could be that they're fragmenting them and they don't know how to then put them back together. Something you said is so vital that, yes, if nothing is happening, that is not the worst. That's neutral. Not going forward. You're not going back. It's just nothing. That's fine. It might feel like a waste of time, but, well, uh, you know, okay, fine. There are a lot of things. That's all that. But no, that's not necessarily doing damage. And also another thing that you brought up was so important. This clearly gets me riled up. This whole thing of just people assuming something about someone else because of a license. And there are plenty of people who will see that someone has a PhD or someone has an MD and think they they must be qualified to do this. It's always case by case. You always, when you go into any environment for any kind of counseling, even any kind of medical care, I want people to know that they are interviewing the clinician. They need to find out about the clinician. It's not for them to just disclose things about themselves so the clinician can interview them. You need to be checking out the person who says they can help you because they could be licensed in what they're helping you with and still not be healthy people. But also, I know someone who spent a lot of years getting very bad treatment from someone who had a PhD only to find out the PhD was in anthropology. So they had no idea it wasn't in counseling and it was never disclosed that it wasn't in anything uh, psychologically based. But so go ahead. I wonder for you, what drew you to coaching to begin with? I think it's interesting that the word that you spoke earlier, which was innocently, um, that I'm in this field, not knowing. And that is true, but I definitely have a history of high control abuse um, from my family of origin. And I also married into that type of relationship. And became that type of parent because of my own history. So that leads me to your question, which is what brought you there? And I knew that I needed help. And I also felt like I could help others. And so the field of social work seemed like the right place for me. And when I was in public service, again, through my own education, there wasn't a lot of teaching about boundaries and or about self-care. This was in the 90s. So I did it badly. <laughs> I did the work in social work not well. I had a successful career, but I was not a healthy person. And I ended up burning out very quickly. I had a large caseload. I had my own issues with codependence. I had my own issues within my marriage that were broken and somewhat uh, dependent. And also as a young mom, every area of my life was contaminated with trauma from my own childhood. And so it felt like I was swimming upstream, but I also, as I was working in the field, was really trying to understand my own process and understanding a lot, unfortunately, by sort of backwards learning, you know, I got myself into situations that I needed to get myself out of and be healthier on the other side of. And so the burnout in the early part of my career was a really big lesson in understanding that it wasn't my responsibility to save the world and or to be everything to everyone. And I also had had I didn't know then, and I had identified that it was codependence, but 
I'm an excellent fawner. I can make my way out of situations and help people out of situations, like really dangerous situations quite quickly because that was my life. So when I left public service, I had a teacher that suggested I go into private practice because, you know, I was involved in the new age movement. I was involved in a lot of natural health and wellness. And she had acknowledged, somehow seen in me and acknowledged that I was a healer. And that made me feel special. And I thought that my work would be important because of what I had gotten myself out of in, you know, the burnout and how I kind of landed, come through this and landed on my feet. And like most people who end up in the coaching industry have had a some type of success story and feel like they're a hero and want to be able to do that work with others. So it is sort of an unfortunate but fortunate set set of circumstances that I ended up in private practice in the coaching industry is because I couldn't really figure out how to be successful in this structure of public service and social work because a lot of my beliefs had sort of ended up in the new age realm. And a lot of the things that had helped me out of my messy situation were the things that I was then teaching and working with my coaching practice. I love how open you are to discussing this. It's very real. It's very honest. And also knowing that there there is no shame in it. In fact, I think I give you so much credit and so much respect for saying it this way. I think about the counseling I did when I was interning or when I was first licensed. And I just wonder if I was any help at all, or if I said, I mean, I was brand new. I feel like a chick that had just hatched and here I'm supposed to be helping someone with life experiences. Really? So for many years, maybe because I, uh, of I I tend to go to the too humble side. I had imposter syndrome uh, for, I guess, a good 10 years where someone would say, I want to make an appointment with me. And in my head, I'd be thinking, why? Why I don't know if I can help you. Um, And if I did, if I was helpful to someone and people kept coming back, I was always sort of surprised. And I realized I probably needed to get over that at some point. But I love how honest and real you are being, and I wonder also if there were moments while you were doing your work where you thought, I don't know if this is what I should be saying or doing or offering this person. I don't know if it's helping, but I don't know what else to offer them. Were there those moments where you were in conflict with yourself? Yeah, I was. And in some ways, like, I don't know if it was imposter syndrome, but I definitely, I had a lot of good teachers that were good at grooming and making me believe that I was capable. So I know that seems like kind of a weird thing to say, but I I had really felt quite admired by the people that were in were in leadership. And so having a lot of people that were telling me that my work was valuable and important kept me doing the work. And I had one particular teacher that had said, Kathleen has the guts of steel. She can handle anything. That just made me stronger. That just made me take on bigger, more intense um, experiences because, you know, I could handle it or I could carry it. I felt like the work that I was doing was being kind of a model of the work that others could do. So the leaders that I was being trained by were using my skills to promote their work, which really fed my feelings of doing good work, as well as a lot of how I showed up for them was with um, volunteering, training, doing presentations, endorsing their work. So that had been sort of this cycle of being involved in an industry, again, that's not regulated and that people are looking to and the the people that are leading it need support or need the somebody to 
show that they're that they are legit. So I was that spokesperson. And one of the trainers had said to me that I was this person that had these guts of steel and I could handle all of the biggest cases and I could take on tremendous trauma and work and work through it with people and have good results. And so recently I was participating in the Writing to Reckon program that Jarette Bullion offers. I had I'd been a writer in that program for over a year. And we get close to each other because we're sharing each other's stories weekly without giving any information. Somebody shared something that was painfully true in their experience. And I couldn't handle it. And it was just that moment that kind of broke the ice for me. And I realized for all of those years, I had been putting things away. Like, yes, I had those experiences that I could work through with my clients. But when it came to this person that I cared about, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in the role of coach and I was just in the role of a peer, their story broke so much in me and made me realize even though I was doing a good job, I was performing for the leaders and making myself something like the way I had done with the abuse within my family, just that I could take it all. I could take it all. I could take it all. And it was a pretty enlightening moment for me to be curious about why I had done or how I had done that. And that really it's tr- it's not a superpower. It's not a superpower to not feel. In my experience, that was praised through my whole life. And I even within myself felt like it was a strength that I could offer my clients. In the meantime, I'm in therapy. I have my own self-care and and people that can help support me. I have mentors and continue to be a coach even when the industry is under scrutiny. And I hadn't always known how to be a good coach. I was always questioning my work. I always felt like I could do better. And I was questioning and listening and working towards a place where I could feel good about it. And I wasn't totally settled with it. So I had to keep asking the questions. And thankfully, when the pandemic happened, people started asking me questions and were concerned about my work and the safety of my work. And it had been the second time that it came up about my sort of new age beliefs and my beliefs that love wins and that all we need to do is think positive and we will link arms and create a new world. And I was under a pretty dark illusion that I was capable and was was capable of helping people create or evolve or transform and become enlightened. And it was so misguided and it was so untrue. And it was based in, I believe, my trauma to want to create a new world and to be something other than what I was and where I came from. There is this notion for a lot of people who feel very capable or who are given a lot of tasks or who are given a lot of kudos for how much they can take on. Then they go out in the world and say, yes, sure. And are feeling also proud of themselves if they have this can-do spirit all the time. Um, But just because you can, and I tell this to clients a lot, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And that the important thing is just to know that you can if you needed to, but that it's important to check in with yourself to see if this is really more than you want to do or more than your system can take on at any given moment. And I think being given difficult cases or being given a big caseload, yes, it is a vote of confidence, but sometimes it's not necessarily what's in your best interest. Um, But you might feel like you can't say that because people have this confidence in you. And you don't want to disappoint them or have them see you differently. There's too much at risk, I think, sometimes to then say, actually, slow, you know, slow down there, Sparky. Stop giving me so many cases. The other thing that I think is really important is this idea of making these promises and being so positive. I mean, I want people to do research into 
toxic positivity and what that does and what it does to a system to be surrounded in toxic positivity because it goes back to exactly what you said that it's not a superpower to not feel and to not feel the negative things is usually what that means. And so when people are involved in toxic positivity, the you can do it and you know if you want it it will happen and you know the magical kind of equations that were given if you want it badly enough then it will come true and you can manifest everything it sets people up for failure cuz they might not reach that or things might not go their way and they'll wonder what they did wrong or maybe they weren't believing it enough and they need to really believe it it sort of always falls back on them um, that it isn't the person who's possibly offered them this false narrative who is at fault here, but it's somehow it's them that they haven't manifested it and they haven't made it come true. And so a lot of people, you're right, will will wonder about themselves and if they're weak or if they really didn't want it. And, you know, it sends your mind in these other places that just further confuse you, I think, and also make you feel critical of, of the self. But I think that there's also something about making promises for people for enlightenment. It's like telling someone that they will be able to be something, something invisible, <laughs> that that's the goal, something invisible. You also then still hold the power because you can decide when they've reached it. They don't necessarily decide that. So it's like taking all the power away while you think you're giving them power. It's really kind of a very trippy sort of confusing thing. Yeah. And I feel there were many parts of my life that I was able to continue to figure out um, my part. And I'm thankful, you know, my first marriage, my ex-husband felt really qualified to make sure that I knew that all the problems in the relationship were mine. <laughs> and I was a good student and I just thought, okay, if this is the problem, then I'll fix it because that I do have control over that. So thankfully, those kinds of life lessons put me on a path. And, you know, at sometimes I think a path of what, like, at what point do we get to stop and say, this is enough, and I am enough. I haven't got there yet. I'm not sure if that question is ever answered. But what you just said, which is interesting, I had gotten into positive psychology and I had known about toxic positivity, but I also backed it with science, which was work by Barbara Fredrickson, and that there was this positive to negative ratio. But so this copywriter had given me a copy that we were going to use on my website, but she said, you know, the word empowered, I, Kathleen and you will be empowered. And I was like, no, that's not that's not true. Like, that's not my job. I'm not here to tell people that they are empowered. That's like me giving them some magic fairy dust that says you're now empowered. That's their job to decide. And so there were things that I knew that were disempowering people. But what I had been trained to know or thought I knew was that I did know better. I could help people be better. And that was based on my agenda. That was based on my feelings that if they were to, you know, this, this fawning superpower that I knew I could predict patterns. So if I was able to help them understand their own patterns, then I could help them understand that they could change those patterns. And when they change those patterns, they will be a better person. So that sounds really good, but there's so much underlying that is not just about, you know, flipping the script. And I had a really, another really um, unfortunate, powerful lesson, which is that I went for a sort of a, I was leveling up my practice and I was going to be an internet sensation in 2017. And I failed badly. I invested a ton of money and I really had, you know, dollar signs in my eyes thinking that this was going to be a big deal. I followed some bro marketing guy online to create this system that was supposed to make me millions of dollars. And I really, really failed badly. And the coaches that I had hired to help me do this were really quick to say, hey, you know, you really have a mindset problem and you have a money problem. 
these are things that you caused. And that's a really lame excuse. And it wasn't true. I knew it wasn't true. There was something inside of me that just thought like, excuse me, you're liars. And yes, I had a problem, which is that I was set up in a system that basically preyed on my vulnerabilities of thinking that if I just plugged myself into the system and without exaggeration, that system cost me $100,000, I would be famous. And everybody says it's not an overnight, it's not a magic bullet, there's no, you know, there's no quick road to success. They tell you all those things while they're selling you tens of thousands of dollars worth of promises. So I started to question a lot because that's my industry. That's, you know, those were the things that I was also participating in, not at that expense, but definitely at an emotional cost where people may have taken on some failed attempt to do something that we had planned or set out together, me as the coach and them as the client. And then for me to hold that you know, flag and say, hey, listen, this is probably because you're not thinking positively enough. Like that's a really shitty thing to say. And it really is what so much, even now, that was in 2017. So years later, it's, you know, it's the hot ticket. People want to be sold that promise. And then when it falls flat, they take the blame. They take the hit. Like that is the system. It's your fault. You get up, you try, you know, wipe off the mud off your face, do it again. It's so cruel to do to people and to get them caught up in this high. And when you fall, you really fall hard, especially if you fall repeatedly. I feel like in in so many of these situations, these companies or people who say they can help you and they can help you with some extraordinary goals will say, this doesn't happen overnight and this takes time. They say that not for you. They say that for themselves so that you don't mind continuously paying them more and more and more knowing, okay, well, I'm going to have to just sort of sit tight and wait and they did say it's going to take time. So if they come back and say, well, you didn't achieve what you wanted to or what we said you could have this month, you need to work on this and you need to change this. And then again, in the back of your mind, well, they did say it's going to take time. And then you just give them more (laughs) and then they kind of are with you on this whole journey and you think they really care, but they're siphoning off of you for longer without you, I think, getting upset about it because you think, okay, well, they, well, they did prepare me. They did warn me. But yeah, I think at the end of the day for you to sit back and say, what do I have? And what did they provide for me except to have me question myself? When people are caught in that, when they're stuck in that, I think they're also afraid of stopping it because there, I think there is this thing like gambling, like, well, if I leave the table now, then, you know, I'm missing the big win that's about to come. I wonder if you had that as well. Well, I kind of wished I had, but I had nothing left. What I had left, thankfully, were questions. Like what kind of questions? What the fuck just happened? Uh (laughs) That's a good one. Uh And because I knew that there was something else going on and maybe, you know, this was this coming out of, you know, I, I left my first marriage after 19 years and really was working on bettering myself as a, as a person in a relationship and as a parent, I was able to really be humble with myself. And when I looked at the patterns in my marriage, I understood my part. And when I looked at the patterns in the relationship that I had these with online coaches and with the people that I was paying, I didn't quite understand it, but it looked like there was something that was visible in plain sight. Like I just didn't know what I was looking at. And I then realized these are very well-skilled perpetrators. This is built on our never enoughness. I didn't understand then. I actually understood through um, Regina Thomas House. She wrote the book Pussy. And I started to understand patriarchy. And then I really dug into systems 
capitalism. I am the daughter of a white settler family. My roots are European settlers. My colonial roots and what I had participated in unknowingly had cut me off from all of my feelings. And I was caught in these wheels. And then the awakening that really shook me was something I've talked about on other podcasts, which is that I had a very dear friend call me out for my not using my white privilege, for not being anti-racist, and for not understanding my role in white supremacy. And that was something that I felt in my body that I could not defend because I knew it was true. So that is when I really started to unpack my role as a safe leader. Unpacking your role is a really important thing to do. There are so many people who wish, wish that the person who they think was manipulating them or in a position of control who may have not been appropriate or may have harmed them in some way or given them a message about themselves. They wish they would have these moments of insight. They know it's not going to happen. And sometimes they've tried and they get kind of this boomerang, you know, they get back on them that, you know, they shouldn't be questioning a person in that way and they're being unappreciative and whatever else. But your availability to look inward as painful as it is, is so important because I feel like we all do this in uh, everyone. We all do this in certain ways unwittingly. And it's important to have someone make you aware. What I'm wondering about though, is from your upbringing, from your marriage, you're going to have a mirror shown in your face that isn't necessarily about you. It's been made about you, but it's actually not accurate. It's just someone needing to deflect back onto you. And so I wonder, I know this is like a nuanced question, but how do you know when it's yours and when it's not? I would say probably for a lot of my life, I didn't know. And because I didn't know, I didn't understand it. But I I definitely was figuring out that there were common themes and There's a whole other part of my life that is really culty, which is that I, in the wellness and new age movement, um, was an anti-vaxxer. I hadn't ever questioned it. And when I met my husband, my current husband, he is a engineer, very fact-based believer. And we merged our families. Our children were teenagers. And we had this, we literally had some pretty explosive blowouts about my beliefs about vaccines. And I thought to myself, well, we're never going to have to deal with this. We don't have children. Almond children, they are at the age where they can make their own decisions. And the two of us can live with these, with this conflict. No big deal until COVID. And that whole question brought up a, like literally a Pandora's box of questions about my beliefs and where they came from. And I would say I believed I had been lied to. I had been told that my family was normal and that these behaviors were okay. And I mistrusted everyone and everything. So I just made up my own rules. So when I came out of that um, belief system, the natural health and anti-vax belief system, Because my husband and I, we worked at it. I literally knew that my marriage was on the line. If not, if I just gave up, but like gave up my beliefs about anti-vax, like I wasn't just going to get vaccinated so that I could stay married. Like that didn't feel like it was the appropriate approach. So we worked on so many parts of our relationship that had, you know, we brought into this relationship, this second marriage, and there were things in his past and things in my past that had contributed to us being together. And it, you know, was the best relationship I had, but not great. (laughs) Um, But the one thing about he and I is that we had shown the interest 
the ability and the capability to work something out. So I trusted him to help me understand my experience with these beliefs. And he held the space for me to do that. Collectively, it took, you know, the whole year, first year of COVID before the vaccines were available. So we were able to, I was able to really do some research and understand my place. And I then got vaccinated and was completely exiled from our community. And then feeling completely desperate, found a few people online that talked openly about being in natural health and yoga communities. I found conspirituality. I found a little bit culty. I found you. I found Yanya. Like I was just taking everything I could possibly get to understand how I had found my way there and how to find my way out. And it was six weeks out of that, six weeks post-vaccine that I was sitting in a my first class with Yanya. And I was sweating. My heart rate was like out. I didn't know if I was coming or going. I didn't know if I was a cult leader, a narcissist, or a soul. Like I had no idea. I was like at the very bottom. I didn't even know how I got there. I didn't know how to get my find my way out. And in that moment, I had trusted enough to be there with Yanya. And actually it was Laura Tucker from uh, For Your Inner Guru who introduced me to to, um, Yanya, although I had known of you and Yanya through Conspirituality and also The Bow and Seduced. So I knew there were people that had the conversation that I needed to hear, but I was so scared. And Laura Tucker specifically was somebody that I felt close to because she had been a coach and she had put herself as a recovered coach. And I wanted to trust that she had some information that I could hear or she could lead me to places that I could ask the questions or be in the right place without feeling like I was you know, just falling into the pattern of being indoctrinated or being, you know, under a new belief system that felt like, you know, cult 2.0. I just needed to trust that I could do better. Yeah. So that was um, two years ago. You are a brave soldier. I mean, that I can, can't imagine sitting through that and being so terrified. And also asking yourself those questions. I love those questions too, because true narcissists don't often wrestle with the fact that they might be narcissists. (laughs) And so that's a pretty good sign, I think, on your part, if you're thinking, oh no, I might be, oh no, because I don't hear, oh no. Uh, I often will hear, yeah, I might be a narcissist, so what? Or deal with it. So but I, I think it is also really important to to think about having a community really abandon you because you have chosen something for yourself. The conditionality of the acceptance can be really harsh and just being pushed out or dropped. It's a very difficult thing when you've been so integrated into a community. It's a very hard thing. And a lot of people will compromise what they've come to think is right for them just so they don't lose the community. So already that takes a lot of bravery on your part. I think it's good then from your vantage point for you, if you can, to let the listeners know what to look for if they're going to be getting involved in, or they already are, in some sort of counseling uh, with a coach or even a licensed professional, but let's say stick with coaches for this discussion, what to look for that could be a sign that maybe that person isn't either qualified or safe to work with. So there's definitely a lineage of coaches that are trained by coaches that are, you know, it's really just an MLM structure. So if you're being trained by a coach, but never actually with that coach, you're being trained by coaches that were trained by coaches. And usually those coaches come at a very high price. So the unnamed coach school out there, there's a couple, their ticket, their for coaches to become coaches are usually between three and four months. 
of um, training that comes at a cost of about twenty to thirty thousand dollars. So those are, I would say, probably those. It's like the puppy mill coaches, where this MLM structure they're recruiting and getting people in. And so these, the bottom of the line are those coaches that are really wanting clients. They're told that they're probably going to be making X number of dollars in the first year if they only just follow these protocols. So a good question to ask is who are they trained by? And did they ever actually have direct training with that, you know, head leader coach? Does that coach even know their name? So that would be, I would say, probably the most alarming coaching system, the MLM type coaches. The next coaching sort of tier to look at is people that are specifically calling themselves ethical coaches or they are teaching ethical coaching. Like, what is that? And how are they qualified to teach it if they are not transparent with their education or their teachers, why not? Coaches often are not transparent with their education and often also not transparent with their pricing. So those are things to look for if somebody is not listing their pricing online or they're, you know, you have to sign up for a call or you have to fill out a questionnaire in order to have the pricing revealed. That's a bit of a red flag. If coaches are not answering the question directly, If you ask these questions and they turn it back on you, you know, some of the same systems of control or coercive manipulation that you see in cults, they've been trained to do that. And they've also been trained to use their language, like weaponize the language so that you may not feel completely in the right mindset to make a decision because it feels confusing. Or it also feels like, this person is kind of up talking where you're like, oh, they must be really smart. That is not helpful. That's a tactic. Again, these are these are quite common in the alt um, or large awareness training. They're all just circulating the same playbook, unfortunately. And these are some of the things that you can do based on your research. I would talk to coaches, clients. I think they should have the ability to have that kind of transparency too. So I have testimonials on my website, but I also know if I were to ask any one of my clients with their own, with permission, if they felt they would want to disclose what their experience has been, then they can, then prospective future clients can talk to past clients or have that communication channel open. Another thing that I don't have, which is something that I I think is important is um, to maybe consider Google reviews because Google reviews can't be altered. So once somebody puts up a Google review, it isn't uh, something that a coach can edit or alter or change. They can respond to it, but they can't actually change it. And so if somebody's out there that has, I would say anybody that has had a bad experience with a coach, if they want to let people know, that they do leave a Google review. So there is that that you can do. And if there's anything else, I would find out not only who their teachers have been, but what other types of training have they had? If it's diversity and inclusion, um, what kind of work do they do with what communities and how, and where do those coaches go for, for um, mentorship, support? Where are they getting their information from, not in their coaching, but in their life so that they're continuing to be students. Oh, this is such an important list. You know, one of the things that I will sometimes tell people is if they can't get a sense of the person they're working with before or even during, they can sometimes get a sense at the end. Uh, Like if you say to them, I think I want to take a break, or I think I'm good. If that's just not acceptable, to the person who you're working with, (laughs) then that might be your first, but it's an important sign that this is not the person to work with because they, they need you more than you need them to a certain degree for a lot of reasons. I wanted to also say that I think going into a field, knowing that you need to provide safeguards and that people deserve them, I'm sure you're going to be very open about yourself, but also be able to tell clients 
this is what is okay to expect here. And this is this is also what's not okay. Like, I'm sure you do some educating. Is that woven in? Because that you have so much information to share on that front. Yeah, it is. I think it's important for people to know that I'm also a student. I'm a learner. I don't know everything. I'm, I make mistakes. This is actually like really super humiliating, but I had a moment actually in a group discussion. It was a cult recovery (laughs) group discussion and I lost my shit. And I was like, I was totally triggered. And I was standing up for an underdog in, in a situation that I felt was unfair. I spoke out of line and I made a mistake and people got hurt. I acknowledged it. I acknowledged it to the community. I acknowledged it to the leader, the group moderator. I acknowledged it to the person that I spoke out of line with. And it's up to them what they are going to do with that. But I had a moment and it was not, it wasn't pleasant for anyone. And I, you know, wish it hadn't happened, but it did. And in those moments, I think we can all learn. And if I can do that with my clients, they can do that with their clients. They can do it with their children. They can do it with their spouse. So I feel like if I'm a leader, part of my leadership is acknowledging when I make mistakes or if I've done something that I wished I hadn't done. We never know what is going to trigger us. I think being given some grace, especially when you're involved in, or if you're running any kind of a support group, that sometimes when people lose their shit, as you're saying, it's because there's this um, cumulative impact where you probably haven't had a chance to say these things or to be an advocate in this way, use your voice. Some of it might also be that you were testing to see if you could, or you were just feeling safe enough to, who knows what, but just to be given that space, like, okay, 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 gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Let's understand this. You know, anyway, I, I am so happy to have you on to talk about this. It's a really difficult subject because there's so many people out there who are looking for help and so many people who are offering help. You need to know that you're with someone who is safe to be with and who is qualified to be doing this work. And there's so many things that people can call themselves without having to have any training. I mean, any training, even if it's a little bit, but some with none at all. And yeah, to do your research and to be a good, uh, smart counseling consumer out there is a really good idea. And thanks for offering some of the guidelines for what people need to watch out for. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you. Thank you so much. You had said when leaving, it should be okay. Like the, it is self-directed. People need to be able to decide when to leave. I think that is really, really, really critically important. The other thing I'd like to add is anybody that is pressuring for that sale to be a 24 hour window or that this decision has to be made by the end of the call. It never does. And if it feel if there's some urgency put behind a decision to work with somebody, please walk away. Oh, I like that. Right. So this immediacy, you have to make this decision or it's going to be gone. Like the whole scarcity model, like this offer will be over in the next 24 hours. Right. That's just a pressure tactic. And it's a it's a red flag. Okay. Oh, I like that a lot. Very important. Okay. So you learn a lot at the very beginning. And in the middle and in the end, (laughs) just, you know, you need to know what to watch out for. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks for keeping our listeners safe. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Rachel. One more thing before you go. It is so nice to talk to someone who is so self-reflective. It is um, a pleasure, actually. There are so many times that I want to tell people, you know, you'll be able to feel really still confident about yourself and good about yourself professionally, personally, if you take a moment to look inward. If you say, I wonder what part I played in something that wasn't healthy not because you necessarily did it on purpose to harm, but just you may have been part of what Kathleen very openly talked about 
are regulated fields or fields where you're trained to sell promises. Whenever anyone says, I can help you, or I got this, or put this in my hands, I'll take care of it, they better be ready to deliver. But so many people will say that. And then when it turns out to not be the case, they can't really help you. They can't solve their problem. They then, in a lot of situations, give themselves permission or are in a field that gives them permission to blame you for it not working. So they can then promise you the world. And then if it doesn't work out, it's because of you. I remember years ago, I went to a meeting of something called the Kabbalah Learning Center, where I wanted to check it out. A lot of people had contacted me about this organization. And I went there for an introductory meeting just to check it out. I remember the instructor saying, if you buy the Zohar, our book, and other books that we have here in in the gift shop, you won't get whatever it is, fill in the blank, whatever you're most afraid of. And they had us go around the room and talk about what we were most afraid of. Well, that will never happen to you. You won't get cancer. You won't ever be divorced. Whatever it is that was most on your mind, this will absolutely solve your problem and prevent that from happening. So I was sort of playing along just so I could be open to the message and not seem like I was antagonistic, but I couldn't help it. And I had to raise my hand and I said, what if you go to all the classes, you pay for all the classes and you buy the books and you read them and you scan them, which was their idea of when you move your fingers along the words, because it's in a language that's no longer understood by most people. And so you're not going to understand what you're reading but you're going to be able to have the energy seep in through your body, moving your fingers along the page and scanning, quote unquote, scanning the words. What if you still get cancer? What if the thing that you're most afraid of happens to you? And there was an immediate response. And the immediate response by the teacher was, ah, well, that will be because you have a blockage. You have an internalized blockage with the energy and it's something inside of you that's keeping it from flowing and protecting you. And I said, what is a blockage? Well, it's a block in your energy flow caused by negative thinking, caused by something you've done in a past life, etc. And I thought, okay, I know what's going to happen next. I'm sure you have a class that's going to help clear blockages. And before I said it, or even had a chance to kind of think it out loud, the teacher said, but we have a class that can help you with these blockages. And so, of course, being me, I said, what if you take the class and you still have blockages? And meanwhile, how do you know you have blockages? Because that's invisible. And could it be that maybe you don't, but that the words aren't magic and it's not going to cure you or prevent things? I then was descended upon by many people who were kind of pretending to be first-time students like me, but really were there in the room as plants to, quote-unquote, help people who are having a hard time understanding. It wasn't that I was having a hard time understanding. I think I was just trying to poke some logic into this, but I did it out loud, not just for me, even though I don't like any kind of controversy. I really don't like setting up tense moments, but I felt like it was my obligation for the other people in the room to hear this, whether or not they were open to it. Most of them were not because I was sort of crashing their spiritual party, but they decided that that I needed help kind of going along with this program. No one could answer my questions. What I think is so detrimental is when people go to somewhere because they're already in pain, And then it's their fault that whatever they're hoping to have to use to get doesn't help, doesn't work on them. There are also a lot of structures around us that we have to deal with that don't protect us. And we are sometimes left on our own to take care of ourselves. We're left on our own also to have our conscience be tweaked. Uh, And what I mean, for example, is this is actually a story I haven't told out loud. But there's something about talking to Kathleen O that just made me feel like "Mm, I want to share because she's openly sharing. In 1991, when I was licensed, when I took my uh, written test and then there was an oral test, you had to do it verbally as well and be able to answer questions on the spot. I think they don't do that anymore. I, as a 20-something-year-old young person, was told after studying for many months for these exams and being very nervous and paying to take courses to prepare 
after getting 3,000 clinical hours, I mean, I was, you know, I had worked really hard for this moment. I was told to go to a hotel in downtown LA, I think it was, maybe Long Beach, somewhere not so close to where I live, to meet with someone who was going to ask me questions on the spot. So that was the oral exam part of the exam. And I was given a room number, which I thought was a conference room, turned out to be a hotel room. And I knock on the door of a hotel room, and there's a man sitting there on a chair with his feet on the bed. There's an actual bed in this room that I have to walk past to get to this table in the back where I'm going to be tested. And this man was doing a power play, which I realize in retrospect. And he had one of the chairs set up facing the end of the bed. He was sitting on the chair and tilting back. So his head was almost leaning on the TV that was across from the bed. And his feet were on the bed. And I walk in and he doesn't say a word to me. And he has everything set up at the table, but I have to somehow get past him to be uh, tested. And I said, excuse me? And he said, okay. I mean, he's just playing mind games. And I said, I, do I, am I being tested over there? And I'm pointing at the table. And he said, what do you think? And I thought, is this part of the test? And I'm young and I'm scared already. And I've never been in a hotel room with a bed right there with a man who's twice my age, a man who I've never met. And I'm wearing a skirt and I'm thinking the only way I can get past him is to climb over his legs. So I said, excuse me one more time. And he just pointed, made an arc with his finger, like just climb over my legs. And so I did. I could have left, but it took many months to set up this test. And I really wanted to start working and I had a job already lined up at the cult clinic in Los Angeles, and I really wanted to get started. So I had to climb over his legs, and I was sweating. I was so anxious. I was so intimidated, and he was smiling the whole time, and he loved it. I called the Board of Behavioral Science, and I called the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists afterwards to let them both know about this, and they both said, that sounds uncomfortable, but you could have walked behind him. What? That was their response. And I got this feeling like, wow, I am unprotected here. And so I'm kind of on my own. And I passed the test, luckily. But my heart was beating out of my chest already. And then it was even more so when I was put in this situation. And now they don't do that anymore. But at the time, there are a lot of organizations that go along with what's okay at the time. And now that would not be okay. But then it was for some reason. Shouldn't have been then. But sometimes you have to almost go against your field. You have to say, you know what? The things that are allowable and allowed by the people around me don't feel right to me. I want to say something. I want to make sure this doesn't happen to other people. I want to warn people. It takes a lot to do that. It takes a lot to do that if that's your livelihood, if you're, especially if you're new in a field. And so I give Kathleen a lot of credit for looking at a system that she was in and realizing how unhealthy the system was and how there aren't safeguards there for her or anyone else and there need to be. And this is not her saying that coaching is bad. This is her saying it needs to be able to be safe for everyone. I believe in it. I believe in what's possible here, but make sure it's okay for everyone to operate within it, including the people doing the coaching. Thank you so much to Kathleen and for all the work that she's already doing and is going to be doing in the future. Lovely to talk to you. I'm glad you had a chance to hear her. Talk to you soon. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore Indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.